Welcome back to the Western Museum of Light for another private tour. I'm Cindy Maka, the director. Today we have a seasoned aerospace veteran and charter member of our docent corps, Fred Peitzman. Welcome back to the Western Museum of Light. We're glad you could join us for another one of our episodes on our little tours of uh, parts of the museum. Today we're going to be talking about wind tunnel testing. Uh, wind tunnel testing was and has always been a very essential part of the aerospace industry. Uh, we have a, we've, we've developed this exhibit to help you understand what it was all about, why it existed, and what are, the, what are some of the things it did. If you'll notice, we have a video that's, that's showing uh, that shows a lot of the kinds of models that have been tested in wind tunnels over the years. Uh, this kiosk also gives you the chance when you come here to be able to push the buttons and learn things like wind tunnels 101. What's a wind tunnel all about? Uh, local history. There were at one time 10 major wind tunnels here in the Los Angeles area. I'm going to talk about a couple of them, but this, this gives you information about a lot more. Design. How are, model, how are wind tunnels and models designed? And then the testing methods. Wind tunnels have been used for a lot of things. The main use of wind tunnels has been to help aerodynamicists and, and airplane designers design airplanes. So they're looking primarily at the aerodynamics of the, of the airframe itself. What, what does the airplane look like? But there's a lot of other kinds of testing too. There's testing to determine whether or not the propulsion system is going to work right. There's also testing for aeroelastic effects, flutter, to assure that the structure of an airplane, especially of high-speed airplanes, is adequate so that, uh, so that the airplane will not come apart in flight. Very important thing. I'd like to tell you about why wind tunnels came into being. Uh, the Wright brothers actually used a wind tunnel on some of their, their early experiments, but they mainly used a wind tunnel to uh, help them develop the airfoils that they were going to use. What, what would the wing look like? But as airplanes started to get a little bit fancier, a little bit more sophisticated, going faster, doing more things, it became obvious that there, were, there was a lot to designing and building an airplane. And if you had to find out how it was going to fly by building the airplane and then flying it, uh, that could be both very expensive and very dangerous. Because if you didn't have the airplane designed really right, uh, it could be unstable. Uh, you might pull back on the stick and uh, find out that, you, uh, uh, that things happen that you don't want to happen. So they really knew that they needed to find a way to be able to test things before they actually built the real airplane and put a pilot in it. It wasn't until about 1930 uh, when the first significant wind tunnel was built. This was a tunnel that was built, these were tunnels that were built that were large enough that now you could test a significant size model of, a, uh, of an airplane in the wind tunnel. And that's what we're going to talk about next. The first major wind tunnel in the Los Angeles area came about in the late 1920s, early 1930s, when Caltech in Pasadena uh, got money from the Guggenheim Foundation to build a low-speed wind tunnel. Now, when I say low speed, it was still 200 miles an hour. And that was pretty good speed for those days. That was what, the, what airplanes were flying. Uh, but, uh, uh, but, that, but this was the first significant wind tunnel, a wind tunnel that was big enough that you could test good sized models, like this model. The tunnel was actually a round wind tunnel. It was 10 foot in diameter, and it was powered by a surplus World War I submarine electric motor that drove fan blades that, that pulled the air through the wind tunnel. The very first model that was tested in that tunnel in, the in 1930, 1931 was this model. This is a model of the Northrop Alpha. The Northrop Alpha was a very significant airplane designed by Jack Northrop. And it was, uh, uh, it, uh, like I said, was the first airplane that was tested in that wind tunnel. Now, 
the purpose of the test was to measure all of the forces and moments that act on the airplane to determine what the flying qualities of the airplane would be before they actually had to build the airplane. Uh, the model was built out of wood. Now there was an advantage of that. The advantage of that was it's fairly easy to make changes. Wind tunnel testing has always been a very interactive thing. When you, when you, test, a, uh, when you test a model in a wind tunnel, you hope, you hope that everything will turn out the way that the, uh, the designers had predicted. But that usually isn't quite the case. You'll find that there are some things that don't perform the way you want. And by the way, when you test, you have to test this model through every con conceivable condition that the airplane will fly in. You have to test it through all of its angles of attack, angles of side slip. You test with flaps, and you test with ailerons, you test with the rudders. You have to determine how all of these things work. And it's almost invariable that you will change things. And so as you're running the wind tunnel test, you look at the results from the, from the, uh, from the prior run, and you say, are you happy or are you unhappy? And if you're unhappy, then people scratch their heads and say, how can we change things so that it makes the airplane better? Almost invariably, with every airplane, the airplane looks a little bit different after a wind tunnel test than it did before that wind tunnel test. Now, to be able to measure those forces, we used something that was called a balance. Now, a balance uh, comes from, the, from, the, from the, the time of scales. If you had a scale, like when you, when you go to the doctor's office and you, uh, and you step on the scales, uh, the, uh, you step on the scales and they move the balance weight across until it balances your weight. And that's where the term balance comes from. But this was an external balance. Uh, the model was mounted upside down in the wind tunnel. If you notice, there are, are several struts underneath the model. I hope you can see them in the view here. There are, there are mounts that, that hold the model. Uh, that's where the model would have been attached in the wind tunnel. You would have mounted it upside down, and there would have been wires that went through the roof of the wind tunnel uh, that, uh, that held the model. Those wires then went up over pulleys and went up even further then to scales. And originally, those would have been like a scale like you would have measured a truck on, uh, or a scale like at the doctor's office where you would move a weight and you would measure things. So this was very labor intensive. There took a lot of people because you were measuring enough measurements so that you could get all of the forces and, and moments that acted on the airplane. Uh, then, of course, people had to, had to do something with that data. If you're measuring just pounds, well, pounds don't do you much good. What you need to know is what the lift is, what the coefficient of lift is, the coefficient of drag. This took a number of people who were uh, who were using calculators to then calculate all the data and turn it into forms that the aerodynamicists and the designers could use. So this, is, this was kind of the start of, of, uh, of, of wind tunnel testing. By the way, a lot of things that got developed in the tunnel were like the fillets along the side, along the side of the fuselage. Uh, you, you would find that uh, by, by changing the shape of those fillets, you would improve the drag characteristics of the airplane. So every airplane, every airplane's configuration was shaped. A lot of the shaping took place in the wind tunnel. Now, that wind tunnel, the, the uh, Caltech wind tunnel, the, we called the Gausset wind tunnel because it was from the Guggenheim Aeronautical Laboratory at the California Institute of Technology, that wind tunnel was the only major wind tunnel that was in operation as the US started into the preparation for World War II. So every major airplane that was used at the start of World War II, that was developed in Southern California at least, was tested. A lot of their development was done in that wind tunnel. Now because the war was coming along and that tunnel was now overwhelmed with people that needed to run tests, that's when all of the other aircraft companies like Northrop and uh, Lockheed and North American built their own wind tunnels. 
they went on from that time. Uh, World War II, of course, was mainly a subsonic war. Airplanes were flying under 500 miles an hour. After World War II, airplanes started going faster, trying to break the speed, the, the so-called sound barrier. Uh, and so there were higher speed airplanes, uh, higher speed airplanes, and therefore higher speed wind tunnels that were needed. So there were transonic wind tunnels, supersonic wind tunnels, and then of course along came the space age, and we now had hypersonic wind tunnels. Uh, Northrop, where I worked, had a had a wind tunnel that would go up to 14 times the speed of sound. So there's lots that you can learn about wind tunnels. And uh, in our limited time, that's, that's about what I can tell you about uh, testing. By the way, that, that tunnel, the, the Gaussian tunnel, operated until sometime in the 1980s, 1990s for, wind t for airplane testing. Unfortunately, the, uh, the Northridge earthquake ended its career as an as a airplane testing facility. That external balance that they had was a very precise thing. Everything had to be really aligned. Even though Pasadena was a long way away from that earthquake, it, it jiggled things enough that it put them out of alignment and it was going to cost too much money to fix. So that ended the, the career of that wind tunnel for doing airplanes. But it did a lot of other things late in its life. Uh, some of the Olympic athletes were tested in that wind tunnel to help them determine what position they could be in if they were on a luge or uh, skiing to help cut their, their, their drag. So wind tunnels have been used for a lot of things besides, uh, uh, b besides airplanes. Another element of our wind tunnel exhibit tells about how things are measured in the wind tunnel. Uh, in this display board, uh, we talk about how forces were measured. Uh, when we talked about uh, the, uh, the Gaussian wind tunnel, we talked about external balances. As we got into the more computer age and electronics age, we had internal balances that were much more efficient, much uh, faster to, 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 uh, to, to be able to collect data. Uh, but a lot of the testing also had to do with, with measuring pressures. When you measure pressures, the traditional way to do it uh, was to use a manometer tube. Uh, if you blow on a tube, and the, and the tube is a U-tube, and there's, and there's liquid in the tube, as you blow on it, it'll make the liquid rise in the tube. And that's the whole theory of, uh, of, of how you can measure pressures uh, in a wind tunnel or any place else. Uh, if you, you, know, you know how high the, the, the liquid rises, and from that you can calculate what the pressure is. The reason I like this picture is it shows one of the first times that women really started to get involved in aerospace. During World War II, because most of the men were off fighting the war, there was a lot of wind tunnel testing going on at NACA and at all of the companies. And because of that, there was lots of data that had to be taken. There were, there were manometer boards that had to be read by hand. Somebody had to go along at each one of these tubes. They would have to measure how high the, how high the liquid went. And then that data would have to be reduced. The same way with all of the data that, that was taken from the external balances. All that raw data was just pounds. It had to be turned into things, and there were some fairly sophisticated equations to do it. There were a lot of women, especially women who had training in mathematics, degrees in mathematics, who were very good at this kind of thing. So NACA and all the aircraft companies had a large group of women who were the data reduction people for reducing wind tunnel data. I hope you've seen the film Hidden Figures, or read the book. It came out a few years ago. And it talks about NASA, or actually NACA before that, and how women played a role in plotting the trajectories for the early space race. The reason that that group of women existed at NASA was because of the NASA wind tunnels. They logically, after, after they had done their wind tunnel work, 
and there was a lot of calculations that were needed in space, that's where what they did next. I, I hope you've enjoyed this little insight into wind tunnels. Uh, come down to the museum, and uh, when you're here, don't forget to ask whoever takes you through what they did. We're, we're in an area where all of the aircraft companies, all of the space companies still are, and we have lots of people that have been involved in everything from being engineers, technicians, vice presidents, planners, all kinds of things in those industries. There's lots of stories that you can hear but ask. Thank you.